we've got a couple of very cool presentations, and I'm going to kind of let them, uh, Joe, if you want to go first on this, um, kind of introduce uh, what you're doing here, why you're doing it, and why uh, anyone should care <laughs> about this, uh, because it is a very cool, very low-cost project uh, that gives you, uh, you know, a, a pretty nice output on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I've always said that mappers is a really great way to like figure out how sensors work on the helium network. Um, I'm kind of looking at this project as just another way to get in there and understand LoRaWAN and, and really start to see what this network can do. Um, indoor air quality is a, it's, it's always one of these uh, invisible dangerous things that people don't really think about. Um, when I was in college, uh, one of my professors was like, I think he did his PhD in indoor air quality. So he's just always talking about particulate sizes. And, uh, I think it's sort of uh, buried in the back of my head, and especially with COVID now, that there's just all of this discussion about air circulation and uh, how long it takes to clear things out and filtration and all of that. Um, this is a really easy way to start getting into that. Uh, normally, to buy one of these sensors, you're talking 30 ish bucks just for the sensor alone without a case or anything uh, and that's not even if you want a good one like i think i have a sensorion sensor in a case that was 40 or 50 bucks um and then i had to go buy all the cabling and everything for it as well um so ikea is selling these little sensors um ooh, probably start my presentation um and uh i let me kick this off um, yeah, I, I basically stumbled across these things and realized that they'd be a really great candidate to get them working on LoRaWAN. Uh, so this is the, I'm not even going to attempt to say it, this is the indoor air sensor from Ikea. Um, if somebody wants me to, <laughs> to tell me how you say that, please uh, jump in. Um, so I was just browsing Twitter earlier this month uh, and sort of stumbled across this post. Um, you know, of course, there's already an existing huge like ESP A266, ESP32 community of folks that finds these things. And then the first thing they do is figure out like how to hack an ESP32 into them. Um, and I've always been really excited to start seeing more of that happen for LoRaWAN and the Helium network. Um, and so when I saw this, uh, I did a little bit more digging around. Um, yeah, I was like, oh, this could be a good, good Helium project. Um, like, what is it? It's it's an indoor air quality sensor that changes its light color. That's it. It's not connected. It doesn't do anything um, other than sort of give you some really granular sense uh, or a coarse sense rather of how your indoor air quality is. Um, digging into that Twitter post found there, there was a good project already sort of established here. Um, they had already done sort of all of the work and figuring out the, the way that the packet could be interpreted. Um, so I was able to basically, uh, to, to Robert's earlier point, like do a lot of copy pasting and sort of work my way through this project without a lot of overhead. The LoRaWAN stacks are already pretty well established. The, uh, the, the code implementation for this project um, was not particularly painful. Um, so of course, yeah, 13 bucks, all right, I'm sold. Um, the uh, Heltec cube cell, again, 13, 20 bucks. Uh, that's a pretty easy drop in thing. Um, I would have used the uh, helium dev kit, but it didn't fit in the enclosure uh, with the board that I have. I need one of those small carrier boards and it would have been a great candidate. Um, so next time, next time I'll, I'll be ready to go with that. Uh, so anyway, I, I had a couple of these on hand. So I was able to knock this out in the weekend. Um, and uh, so it's like, we've got all the parts, so let's build one. Um, I'm going to give this uh, this this next part's a little bit more of just a tutorial. Um, I'm not sure how far in the weeds we want to go as far as like soldering things on camera. I don't think anyone has the patience for that. So I'll try to do a little bit of hand waving and fast forward through those parts. Um, and don't have to save questions for the end. If you have a question, just jump in. Um, the The way I like to generally start most of my projects particularly demo stuff is just to spin up a couple of devices at the beginning of the project, because uh, in order for that device to become live on the network, it needs to get added to a filter, which takes a little bit of time. So if you don't already have one, create a Helium console account, 
go create a device. It comes with a bunch of data credits. So you're basically ready to go with just an email address. Um, so here I've, I've created my device, I've got my keys. Um, and then all we have to do at this point is just take those keys and put them into code. So those are gonna go into this OTAA um, set of keys. They go in in the same order that they're shown on the screen here. So it's all the, uh, what's that, Travis? The main byte first or something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, most mo most significant or least significant. It's called Indianness. Uh, Ian, yeah. yeah. And and what you mentioned a moment ago, you, you can see up in the corner where it says pending. That that's what you were referring to as you know it takes you know twenty minutes or so for the device uh, necessarily to come up on the network. Yep. Yeah, cool. and so it's nice to get this stuff sort of squared away at the head of a project. Then go do all your soldering. It'll be ready by the time you get to it. Um, so yeah, plugging that into code, and then it's like let's let's get in here and take the device apart. Um, and I don't know, just work through the slideshow, and then maybe at the end I can kind of show off what's going on here. Um, so this is the thing opened up. It's just an air particulate sensor uh, with a fan on it to sort of help the air flow across the sensor, uh, and then that board. Uh, houses both the logic for the sensor as well as power distribution and it's got a couple of LEDs on the other side. Um, but the cool thing is that part of this design is that they left this sort of unpopulated header area which has all of the pinouts that we need to sort of tap into the data lines of this device uh, as well as get power off of it. Uh, so what we can do is we can take the five volt, the ground and the data pin and we can actually power our dev board off of these power rails and get the data. So we don't need to run in any additional power. We don't need batteries or anything like that. Um, so this is the IKEA side of the device. And then this is our cube cell side of the device. And I'm just showing it uh, on the front and the back because one of the most frustrating things about this device is that the front of the board with the LED and everything on it is not the side with the silk screening on it. <laughs> so you end up having to do all this like translation back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I'm using here is the ground, the five volt and the data pin. And that's on uh, GPIO one, which confusingly enough is labeled as two on the board for reasons unknown to me. Um, I did all the hard part for you. So now if you do is follow the illustrations. Uh, so we can take those, glue them together, and that's it. Uh, we've attached this dev board to the uh, IKEA device, and now it can receive that serial data. Uh, it's a UART signal coming over to pin two, um, and then the code will do sort of everything in between. Um, but of course, I couldn't leave it there. I am um, totally addicted to 3D printing, and any chance I can get <laughs> to make something a little bit nicer, I will do that. Uh, so this is just a bracket that sits inside of the case uh, and houses the cube cell in a way that it's not sort of just dangling around in there. Um, it also makes it easier to sort of work on. Um, the this is this is going to show off the soldering. So this is a little different than how I'm actually recommending it now. Uh, these resistors in here are acting as a voltage divider. Uh, I was concerned initially that the power coming from the uh, the IKEA board was going to be a little bit too high voltage for the three volt cube cell. Uh, turns out they didn't really seem to complain, and I've had them running. That maybe it'll die on me eventually, but right now I'm running one with a voltage divider and one without to step the voltage down, uh, and I don't see any difference. So. Uh, if you don't have resistors on hand, you don't have to worry about that. I guess it's my my statement there. Yeah, because you um, could run um, off of that USB. That's going to be a five volt um, uh, power power source as well, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the the cube cell. It's a good point. Um, it's used to taking five volt in on that USB port, uh, yeah. but the device itself is actually it's getting stepped down through the. The IC is that you see closer to the USB port there, uh, and it's operating at like 3.3 volts. Uh, so I was worried about possibly frying something, but yeah, it, they seem to be pretty tolerant. 
they make stuff better than they used to for this kind of stuff at least um but yeah you get everything plugged in there and uh boom it's you've you, you flash the firmware that you put those keys into. Um, and then in this case, uh, in Helium console, I used the Google Docs integration. Um, and Mike's presentation on data cake will dovetail really nicely into this as well. Like all of this data loves data cake, like go do it there. Um, I just tend to like throwing things into Google Docs as a, a first step. Um, and so what we're seeing here is about 24 hours worth of data. Um, and it's kind of cool. You can sort of see it uh, overnight trend off to be a better air quality. And then during the day as cars are driving around and I'm moving around, the air quality uh, deteriorates. Joey, mm -hmm. is that is that uh, like parts per million? Is that what the spikes are? Like a big number is a thousand part, parts per uh, million or whatever. Is that what, is that what we're seeing? I think I'd, I'd have to double check it um, in my GitHub project. I did find a white paper that kind of broke down what this is doing, but okay. I believe we're looking at something that's like micrograms per cubic okay. meter or something like that. It's a it's a different okay. measurement. And they might translate. I'm not actually sure. But where where big numbers are bad, low numbers are good. Is that exactly? Okay. Yes. Yeah, low numbers are good here. And this is measuring specifically the PM 2.5. So it's the the bad air particles that like to get in your lungs and live there um, instead of, you know, they stick in there. Um, Do you know where and these, then, uh, IKEA products turns green, yellow, and red? Like what numbers it, do, does, it does that at? Yeah, so uh, the IKEA product surprisingly does it at, um, not a really great threshold. I think it starts to turn yellow at like 30, uh, which like you could be smoking in your house and it, it's only gonna start like hitting into that threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a really good article. It's the same one that I was referencing where they sort of compare the levels that this thing normally changes color at to what like federal guidelines are for air quality. And they're not quite aligned. Um, so if you're seeing this thing turning yellow or red, uh, you should definitely start thinking about uh, finding ways to improve your air quality. Um, uh, it'll turn, you know, like if you burn toast in the kitchen, like it's probably going to turn red, right? And that's like that level of smoke kind of thing. Um, but, now, you, you did a project yeah. a while back where uh, you were actually going over just the, the off-gassing of furniture in your house and how, and how that affected um air quality right uh i may have talked i don't think that was me um oh okay okay I, i'm probably off base here somebody else i no, I, I know we we talked about it um you know at some point yeah, it's true uh, carpeting too mm -hmm. uh carpet paint um yeah all of this stuff is particulate in the air but this is not going to necessarily pick up like the vocs and things like that it has to be like a, a physical particle um but yeah. Gotcha. It's, it's all of concern. And, and you had mentioned um, that this is using like a UART uh, connection uh, coming from the board over to uh, over to the microcontroller that's then sending that over to LoRaWAN. How is the transmit uh, transmission uh, rate uh, working on this? And are uh, you having to yeah, parse so things out on the serial side on the microcontroller? Yeah. So. Uh, I don't do any requests to the board. The uh, IKEA board just kind of sends it whenever it feels like it. It's got it. It's doing its own polling internally, and then I'm just tapping off of the. Uh, I'm receiving that data only. I'm, I'm not asking for any data. Uh, so basically, right. keeping that channel open, and then as those UART signals start to come through, uh, parsing those. And uh, there's a in the code that I reference at the head of the call that they do some checksum and. Um, header detection, which makes for a much cleaner data signal. Uh, and then it is binning those at an average of the last five. And so when I send that LoRa signal, um, I'm just doing that on a, an interval. So say a minute, um, earlier in the chart here is a minute. And then later in the chart that you're seeing is more like an hour. I'm settling in around 15 minutes. Um, and then 
it's just taking that average from that point of time and then sending that off. So the average is generally collected over a period of uh, uh, 30, 40 seconds or so, I'd say. And so the data could get a little busy coming off that UART, but you're you're not sending all of that over the over the LoRaWAN, and so correct, um, yeah, yeah, gotcha, cool. Yeah, I'll, that, that's a good point. I'll I'll try to dig into this a little bit more. Um, I'll switch to the code and we can take a look at some of that stuff because it, it's actually really interesting the way that all ties together. Um, uh, I, I guess the one other thing that I wanted to say here is like you've got all this data and then it's kind of like well now what and i also like to try to think about like what is the the human use case what is the product output of something like this um and realistically most people don't need uh to the minute air quality data of every room in their home uh i know i'm probably speaking to the wrong audience for that statement but uh, <laughs> for most people uh they don't care um but it's something that's kind of be important to them. And so it's nice to think like, what are the ways that we can simplify that, that scenario for folks? So, you know, now that we have the data, can we tie that into like a home assistant or some other sort of automation platform, its own app? Um, so when air quality starts to deteriorate in a bedroom or an office or, you know, my home in general, uh, can it go ahead and turn on my air purifiers? Can it send me an push notification to say like, hey, maybe go somewhere else or open a window. Um, the, the really subtle tie-ins to our everyday life, I think is where this stuff starts to become really interesting um, and changes the way we approach, you know, living in our homes. Um, that, that's it. This is, this is the sensor itself. It's happy living amongst my plants. Um, I actually have one um, also at my office and another at the workshop. Um, because they're cheap, why not? Um, and uh, with that, uh, we can take a really quick look. Um, my camera turned off, this is my cheap way of sort of broadcasting, so I'm not gonna go too much detail there, but uh, you know, you're seeing the cube cell, you're seeing the 3D printed part. All you need is three wires to tie those two together, um, a screwdriver, and, and you're good to go. Um, and then to your point, Travis, uh, we can take a really quick look. This is this is VS Code. Uh, so this is the IDE that I've done the building in here. Uh, VS Code has a plugin that's really nice called Platformio that'll let you send this stuff over to a serial device. Uh, but it'll transfer a bunch of different ways, I guess. But uh, plug in the USB and it'll load your code. Um, this is the file that's doing all of the heavy lifting on that UART read. Um, and so what we're doing is we're establishing a serial, uh, a software serial connection. So it's it's reading off of this GPI-01 pin, which is the pin two on the cube cell. Um, the RX pin is, is not used in this case, we're just doing the, the transfer pin. Um, sets up a little buffer, does some reading of the data, uh, and then, like I said, there's these checks on whether they're valid headers or valid checksums. Uh, what you'll notice when you're playing with uh, UART and these signals is like if you take your jumper pin and just wiggle it in the breadboard, you'll just see data start flying through because it, it's taking every little uh, hiccup in that pulse as trying to interpret it as data. Uh, so these checksums are valuable. Um, and then let's see, where are we at here? Uh, yeah, if it's good data, we, we log it into an array and sort of calculate out an average, and then that becomes available uh, globally to the program, and then internally to the LoRaWAN side of it, I can just build my packet, um, and that all gets sent off uh, over the network into console. Uh, and you really don't have to know how any of this stuff works uh, if you wanted to build this project. You can pull down the code, uh, set up VS Code, set up Platformio, uh, plug the things in, load your keys, and you're off to the races. <laughs>